I want to take you back in time and uh, uh, talk about spy radios right from the very beginning up to the present and uh, a little bit about enigmas and so on. We go way, way back to uh, Julius Caesar. And uh, he didn't have radios, but he used uh, an encryption method called the Caesar Code, uh, in which he transformed one letter into another letter so that uh, if anyone captured his messages, they couldn't tell what the messages were all about. And uh, you sort of fast forward from Julius Caesar to the Civil War. And in the Civil War, that was the first war in which they really started using uh, telegraph and uh, the instruments that they used during the Civil War are absolutely beautiful. This is a Civil War telegraph set. And of course, they're sending regular Morse code. So the messages could be intercepted with a device called a Civil War pocket spy telegraph set. And of course, I just happen to have one of those little beauties here. Uh, you carry it around in your pocket with a cover on and then when you want to use it you take it and open it up and uh, you take one of these terminals here and you hook it to your bayonet and jam it into the ground and you take the other terminal and you hook it to a piece of bare wire and throw it over the enemy telegraph line and the uh, telegraph lines weren't insulated in those days so that made a complete circuit and this little sounder that you see here maybe you can hear it clicking away, uh, will click out the messages that the enemy is sending. And if you're real good, you can use this telegraph key here uh, to send false messages to the enemy. So these little sets are pretty hard to come by, but they are uh, essentially the Civil War version of what we're going to be talking about uh, in spy radio communications. And during the Civil War, of course, they're using the standard um, Morse code, and everybody knew the Morse code in those days, so they had a, a Civil War uh, code wheel, and you can see this is the Confederate States of America, uh, and it is a code wheel, and if you wanted to send a message, you set the wheel to a particular setting, let's say where A is across from E, and then all of the other letters have other equivalents. So you can encode a message in that way. And if the guy at the other end sets his code wheel to the, exactly the same position, he'll be able to decode the message. And uh, so that was sort of the beginning of the Enigma machine. And we'll see when we talk about the Enigma that really the Enigma machine is nothing more than a simple code wheel like this in which every letter that you type spins the inner wheel and changes the relationship between one letter and the other. So each time you type in a letter, you then spin the wheel around and there's a new setting. A uh, pretty nifty device invented by a guy in Germany. We'll talk about that in a little while. But I'd like to start out um, in sort of the present day. We've gone from... Uh, Caesar to the Civil War, and I'm um, going to share a screen here and hope that works with you okay. Uh, okay, is that coming through okay? Someone let me know. Okay, thank you. Yes, yes. Okay, so we're going to be talking about spy radios and uh, uh, spy radio communications, a little bit about the Enigma, and we're going to go on and talk about some of the very latest CIA bugs and the interesting technology behind uh, the use of these bugs. I think you'll be surprised by some of the stuff we will be uh, examining. Uh, we start out with this silly little guy here, and that's me uh, at age 15. And that was in 1953, uh, and it's now nine, nine, 2023. And so we are now 70 years later. Uh, than that guy. And uh, that's my start in ham radio. I got started and really loved it. I was very lucky because my uh, parents had a lot of money and not 
true for most hams, but I just went to daddy and I said, daddy, I want a radio receiver. <laughs> he said, sure, son, go buy one. Daddy, I want a Collins radio receiver. Sure, son, go buy one. <laughs> so I had a lovely Collins to start out with, but the guy uh, that sold me the Collins wouldn't sell me a Collins transmitter when I got my license. He said, kid, if you buy a transmitter, you're going to be an equipment operator all your life. You're not going to understand what's going on. You've got to build your first transmitter. And so on my left shoulder there, you'll see my ICO 75 watt crystal control novice transmitter that I built. And then one year later, thanks to Radio Row in New York City, uh, where there was just wall to wall, incredible equipment for sale, stuff on the street. It was a pig heaven for a ham. Uh, one year later, my shack looked like this. Uh, I had a, a kilowatt transmitter over on the left with a pair of 813s. The uh, Collins receiver is still there in the middle, but I had managed to get a very, very unusual Hallicrafters dual diversity receiver, that thing with the two dials on the table there, DD1. And on the right, you see some army surplus equipment. There are, of course, lots and lots of surplus equipment because it was right after the end of the war. And uh, in uh, 1953, the war ended in 45. So all the stuff that had been used in the war was becoming available as surplus equipment. And I really enjoyed picking up all these various pieces of equipment, spy radios, and fixing them up and using them. So let's just start out uh, with the reason that you need spy radios in the first place. We'll talk about the German occupation of France as a, a typical occupation, which a, uh, an army comes into a country and just takes over the country. And here are the soldiers coming in. And the soldiers, of course, needed a place to live. So they threw all the furniture out of the apartments that they didn't want in the apartment onto the street. And they took over the apartments. Of course, the people in these countries don't like that a whole lot. And uh, the um, population generally splits up into three different parts in the uh, aftermath of an invasion. The citizens either do nothing, uh, just sort of sit there and watch what's going on, and they continue to do nothing during the war. But a small number of those citizens get so upset that they form a resistance movement in which a bunch of them get together and try to work against the invading army. And that's what we see on the left there, the resistance, the patriots, they become involved in active fighting and in spying. And in order to do this effectively in World War II, they had to use radio equipment. And of course, very few citizens know how to use radio equipment. So they couldn't just receive news and send intelligence using radio equipment. First of all, they didn't have much of it. Secondly, they didn't know how to use it. So you need to have trained radio operators dropped into a country after it's been invaded to help the resistance with their communications. And the British down on the bottom here trained clandestine spy radio operators, parachuted them down into um, France and other occupied countries where they helped the resistance and sent information back. The third group of citizens are the collaborators, the traitors. And they also are spying, but they aren't spying for the uh, allies, they are spying for the invaders. And they are watching what the resistance is doing, hunting for radio equipment that's being used by the resistance and reporting back uh, anything that they can to the invading army, as well as uh, uh, killing some of the resistance if they catch them. So you have these various factors going in a given country. And uh, here are the uh, resistance uh, actively fighting against the invaders. Um, they put uh, explosives on the railroad tracks, anything they can do to dissuade and disrupt. And at the same time, they're also taking photographs. 
and uh, using hidden cameras. This lady has a Roloflex camera inside her pocketbook which she's looking for a Kleenex in there, but she's actually taking a photograph and uh, some very cleverly disguised cameras were used for this purpose. This is a uh, cigarette lighter with a very nice, very well-designed camera with a variable F-stops built into the cigarette lighter, and it actually lights cigarettes. So here's a guy lighting a cigarette while also taking a picture. Uh, very clever stuff developed to try and get away with taking pictures of the enemy. Here's a rather unusual way of protesting uh, in which uh, this guy is protesting clothes rationing by not wearing any. So the resistance can do all sorts of strange things. Um, we'll focus in on clandestine radio receivers, first of all. And these were necessary in order for the resistance to get information about what was going on in the war and to find out what the uh, allied forces, England and America and so on, uh, needed to know. And uh, the clandestine radio receivers were absolutely forbidden in Europe uh, by the Germans. And if you were caught with one, there was no question you were just hustled off and shot. Um, therefore, they were hidden pretty carefully. Here's one uh, hidden inside a suitcase, a couple of plug-in coils to change frequency and uh, earphones. And when you close up that suitcase, it looks fairly innocent. Uh, on the top, we see a normal looking uh, electric iron, a telephone book, and the leg of a piece of furniture. And on the bottom, we see the uh, uh, the iron uh, showing a two-tube radio built inside it, the telephone book with a radio built inside it, and the, the furniture leg with a radio built inside it. So all sorts of different techniques were used to hide the radios and still have them available. Uh, radio phonographs were, uh, were a good way to do this. A phonograph looks pretty innocent on the left, but if you take it apart, you see a radio built into it and the same thing down on the bottom. The phonograph on the left looks totally appropriate, whereas if you look a little closer, you find that uh, it has a radio set built into it. And these are all receiving radio sets. Um, on the left, a brownie camera and a thermos bottle, and on the right, the inside of the brownie camera showing the radio and um, the inside of the thermos bottle showing the radio receiver. Uh, here's a rather unusual one um, using the uh, the, uh, um, false teeth in a person's mouth uh, hooked up to an antenna with a diode receiver. And strangely enough, if you impose an electrical voltage into a person's mouth, uh, the person, if it's a, an audio frequency voltage, a person will be able to hear the sound. So this is an um, interesting way of using that rather unusual physiological uh, phenomenon. Um, this was the most widely used of the uh, radio receivers by the resistant. It's called a sweetheart radio receiver. And uh, many hundreds of these were made and parachuted down into Europe. They were made in Europe, in uh, uh, England, and parachuted into Europe. The, uh, there's a little tuning dial on the left and the receiver parts on the left here, a battery compartment on the right, and a pair of uh, uh, plug-in earphones um, is in the tray in front. And uh, of course, these radios had to be hidden too. And here's a, a sweetheart radio hidden inside a clock. Um, and here is one being used by the resistance. Uh, the guy in the middle is tuning the radio and uh, one uh, he and the guy on the right are listening uh, with one earphone each. So a very effective way of listening in. But the problem is when you're doing this kind of thing, you have to have some kind of an antenna. And the antenna is the most dangerous part of the whole process because it's hard to, to hide an antenna. The wire sort of stands out. You have to 
uh, shinny up a tree and run the wire up the tree or something like that. And uh, that is one of the ways that uh, these guys got caught most often is when they were foolish enough to hang a wire from a house out to a tree and uh, somebody would spot it. And uh, there were enough um, collaborators in Europe so that there was always a possibility that your neighbor would see this wire and turn you in. Uh, so quite a bit of danger uh, in doing this. Now, interestingly enough, uh, the Germans provided every single German person who wanted one with a receiver uh, so they could listen to the glorious voice of their glorious leader, uh, Adolf Hitler. These receivers were called Volksempfangers. Folks were people, and Empfanger is the word for receiver people's receivers, like a Volkswagen is a people's car. This was a Volksempfanger or people's receiver. And every one of these came with a red card that you see down on the bottom that said, uh, this receiver is for listening to Germans only. Anybody who is caught with this receiver listening to broadcasts from outside Germany uh, stands the possibility of being executed. So don't tune your receiver outside of Germany. And interestingly enough, the Germans would transmit a high powered signal on the frequency of the BBC, British Broadcasting Company, that most of the people who were uh, resistance fighters uh, in Germany wanted to listen to. And this signal would override the BBC and it had a tone on it. And the people were warned that if they heard that tone coming from their neighbor's apartment to turn in the neighbor because that neighbor was listening to the BBC, an illegal station. Um, an interesting approach to spying on your neighbors in that way. And he, anytime that tone came out of the receiver, uh, and it did anytime you listened to the BBC, uh, you stood a good chance of being caught. And of course, most people would keep the volume way down. Uh, these things did not have headphones, so it was hard to uh, keep the volume far enough down so you were totally safe. The um, clandestine spy radio operators, most of whom <coughs> were uh, parachuted into uh, Europe, uh, were particularly at risk. If a uh, spy radio operator was caught transmitting with a radio, uh, the penalty was immediate death. And many, many of the people who parachuted into England ended up being executed because they were caught um, with these uh, radios. And uh, they were just typically shot immediately if they were caught with one of these radios. Um, the, uh, uh, the best uh, overall reference to uh, spy radio operations and radio operators is uh, Lloyd Penguin, uh, Pequin, and his book uh, is a classic, wonderful pictures, and he covers all the various kinds of spy radios that I don't have time to cover right now. So uh, we'll look at these. Uh, here is a, a training class for British um, aviators in using spy radios. And these guys are going to be dropped into Europe uh, with a uh, clandestine hidden suitcase radio, and they're going to go on the air. So they had to be pretty good at CW, and they had to be able to fix the radios, and they had to be able to get antennas up that worked. And all of that was taught before they were sent off to Europe. Uh, again, there were not many radio operators in Europe in the resistance, so these guys had to go over and help the resistance to uh, communicate with the Allied forces. Uh, the uh, British had uh, warehouses full of German uniforms, and some of the spy radio operators would dress up in uh, workers' uniforms or in soldiers' uniforms, uh, so they wouldn't be obvious when they parachuted into Germany. And the uh, radio equipment had to be packed very, very carefully. And in the lower right, you can see a typical suitcase radio uh, that's packed in a very, very large 
a shock absorbing box. So it could be dropped by parachute without damaging the radio. And uh, here are some of these tropes um, that radio operators climbing onto an aircraft, getting ready for an airdrop. And uh, after they get on the ground, they set up their radio equipment, uh, typically away from buildings in a forest where they can be sort of um, uh, fairly well uh, hidden from uh, the uh, Germans. And you can see on the left, the antenna wire going up to a tree in this case. Again, the antenna is the biggest problem. Uh, here's another uh, set of radio operators with a couple of people watching for Germans. Uh, the guy on the left has a machine gun in case they're discovered. And uh, here's still another group using a hand crank generator to produce the electricity uh, for the radio set. And again, they're in the woods. Uh, one of the most famous of these uh, radio operators uh, who was parachuted into Europe uh, had the co code name Paulette. And this is a picture of her operating her spy radio transmitter, which is hidden uh, inside a small box. And uh, that box uh, is small enough, the various um, stages or parts of the radio were small enough so that she was able to hide them in various places in her home, one of which was inside a vacuum cleaner. So these radios were capable of being uh, taken apart, some of them, and hidden in this way. Uh, here's a picture of Paulette on the left uh, at 23 years of age when she was um, parachuted into Germany, and a picture of her on the right a few years ago, uh, having done an amazing job, really very surprising that she survived, because every time these radio operators went on the air, the Germans were searching for them using direction-finding techniques, and their lifespan was typically less than a month, in many cases, less than a couple of weeks. Uh, Paulette sent half hour coded reports and then ran far away from her transmitting location, knowing that she would be found by the direction finding teams, the German team, within one and a half hours. So she had, if she was lucky, an hour to get away. And she managed it. Many, many, many of the radio operators did not. Here's a picture of her carrying her suitcase radio. One of the problems with these suitcase radios and uh, virtually all of the spy radios is that they were very, very, very heavy and much heavier than you would expect because they had a multi-winding transformer since they had to be able to work on six volts, 12 volts, 110 volts, and 220 volts. The transformer had to be able to um, accommodate all of those windings and it made for an extremely heavy set and you can, uh, it's hard to convince a, a casual observer that you're just carrying a suitcase full of clothes when it's that heavy. And you can see here, she's a bit struggling a bit with it. In this case, um, this guy has a bicycle and he can put his suitcase radio on the back and not have to worry about the weight of the radio. But uh, the weight of these radios was particularly a problem. Here are some of the uh, spy radios that were used uh, by the resistance during World War II. They are chronicled in a wonderful uh, book by Louis Mulesty and Rudolf Staritz. And the book is a classic, but it's very, very expensive. <clears throat> there are four volumes in the book and the fourth volume is on clandestine radios. And you can see a classic suitcase radio down in the foreground there. Um, here's another version of the suitcase radio. Suitcase radio has typically a receiver, a transmitter, a power supply, and room for a few of the parts, such as a telegraph key and headphones, and maybe a spare tube or two and several crystals. Um, this is a radio known as the Paraset, and it was specifically designed to be dropped from uh, by parachute to the resistance. It used metal tubes and uh, it was uh, 
uh, much more rugged than some of the other sets. Uh, it could stand the jolt of a parachute landing better than some of the other sets. And there's a, a wonderful kit that's being produced in France, I believe, where you can build one of these and put it on the air. It's an exact replica of the original Paraset. Very simple uh, radio. Uh, this is the most typical of the suitcase radios. It's a uh, Mark II B2, and it was designed by a ham, G3 EUR. <clears throat> and if you look at it, the transmitter is the upper square box that you see there with a coil, uh, tank coil plugged in for that particular band that it's set for. Uh, on the right up there, you see a crystal determining the frequency of the transmitter. Uh, down in the toward you, toward the front of the set, you see the receiver uh, with a band switch for the different bands. And uh, can't quite see the numbers on the dial, but uh, it has a dial and a tuning knob down uh, toward you. And on the right is this incredible power supply that uh, can be used with all of those various different voltages and have this very, very heavy transformer in it. Now, picture this this heavy transformer is on one end of the suitcase, and it's very, very hard to make this hold the handle and have the suitcase not droop down in that direction. So that's one of the problems with these sets. It's a, it, it sort of gives away that it isn't just a suitcase full of clothes whenever you carry it. And you can see the telegraph key is up uh, in the upper right-hand corner here. So that's the B2. And we'll take a look at the schematic diagram, really extremely straightforward. Um, on the left, you see the crystal uh, in the grid of the crystal oscillator tube and a bunch of band switches above and below that. Um, and you see the uh, power amplifier, uh, that is the RF amplifier um, amplifying the signal. and uh, then uh, you have the plug-in coils over on the right, uh, a place for a telegraph key. And it, it's just a classic, typical uh, radio set. The uh, uh, receiver RF amplifier, uh, front end of the receiver, uh, has band switches. It's tunable, and uh, it, it goes into the um, um, uh, IF amplifiers and the audio frequency amplifier circuit down at the bottom. So you could you could uh, easily design one of these things. One of the nice things about it is it's easy to understand all the stages of this receiver, and therefore it's easy to repair it in the field. And these guys were given uh, instructions on how to repair the receiver, and they got pretty good at doing it. Uh, the power transformer uh, that I was talking about, you can see it makes a for a very heavy set. You have the power transformer and you have a vibrator for changing the DC to AC to feed into the power transformer. So this is the power supply and this is the, the heavy part of the radio. Uh, here's a slightly more recent version of the World War II spy radio, PRC-1. And uh, uh, here is a PRC-5. Uh, uh, again, a very simple set. For some reason, they put the schematic diagram in the lid of this set. Usually, they don't try and they don't do that um, because they don't want to give away <laughs> the wiring to the enemy. But uh, it's such a simple set that it probably didn't matter very much. And I guess they figured that people that had these sets, they had a lot of spare parts and they were able to repair them. Um, this set has a transmitting tank coil in the upper a part, a receiving coil in the lower right part, and the receiver tuning knob is um, uh, down uh, right on the edge of the meter that you see down there, receiver tuning. Little tiny knob, it's very, very hard to tune, and uh, it's not a very convenient set to use. Has a telegraph key up yeah, at the very top, you can see it inside the lid. Um, here's a slightly more modern version of a spy radio. This was kind of radio used in the Korean War of Vietnam, um, the, uh, uh, called a GRC-109. And again, you have three parts um, on the uh, 
atop you have the receiver on the bottom you have the transmitter bottom right you have a transmitter with a little telegraph key on top there in the lower right corner and the power supply with all of its various voltages switchable is over on the left typical of these kinds of sets and here is another uh, component set quite widely used in uh, the vietnamese conflict uh, the CIA used them. Many, many people used them uh, during that period. Uh, you can see the little telegraph key sticking out of the corner of the set over on the right. <clears throat> uh, compare those with uh, Russian Cold War sets. And uh, these sets turn up in large quantities at the Friedrichshafen Hamfest uh, in Germany every year. I go there to to trade enigmas. And uh, uh, there are just dozens and dozens of these Russian sets, uh, spy radio sets that turn up there. Um, the, uh, uh, when the Soviet Union disbanded, uh, a lot of people grabbed those radios and figured they could make some quick money by bringing them to Hamfus. And, and they, they did succeed in doing that. Lots of strange attempts have been made to to develop radios for special purposes. Here's a, a, a scuba radio that was supposed to work by using an insulated wire uh, for the antenna that would go up to a float on the surface above the swimmer. And then an antenna would stick up from that float. Uh, the fact that this is the only known picture of one of these indicates that it probably wasn't very successful. Um, here's another really strange set. Uh, if you think about it, this is a doggy walkie talkie. And uh, you can see the dog is hooked up with a, uh, a set of earphones over its ears and a microphone. And the uh, the trainer has a microphone and it. It just somehow doesn't sound right. What? <laughs> How's the dog going to talk to the trainer? Maybe um, the dog talks in, in Morse code, woof, woof. <laughs> and in any event, this one didn't get very far either, but the, it was an attempt at a, uh, uh, a dog worn spy radio. Um, nowadays, the uh, uh, military is using a uh, uh, handheld radio that includes not only a really nice overall set, radio set, but also the equivalent of an Enigma machine in that the voice uh, that is transmitted can be enciphered. And this is the radio that you see uh, the, the, our troops using uh, whenever they are deployed, made by Harris. It's RF-310M, an interesting set. Now, locating the spy radios is a whole nother problem. Uh, for the Germans, they had incredible direction-finding devices, uh, both mobile and body-worn. Here's a mobile direction-finding truck that was used to drive around in the streets of Paris, for instance, looking for and listening for uh, spy radio transmissions. And the antenna on top of the truck could be rotated, that thing that the red arrow is pointing to, uh, to help them localize and get a bearing on the radio transmitting station. Uh, here's the guy inside the truck rotating the antenna and listening for a null uh, with his earphones. Uh, the way a direction finding system works is you really need two of these trucks and each truck gives you a bearing from the truck to where they hear the radio station coming from, the sender. And the spot where these two bearings cross on a map tells you quite accurately where the transmitting station is. So you gotta have two of these vehicles out there and uh, their bearings cross and you find the, uh, the transmitter. Um, there are also handheld direction finding sets that the Germans uh, developed and the Americans developed. Uh, this one is built into a suitcase. You can see it has a, a loop antenna and simply by rotating the suitcase, you can uh, identify the location or the direction to the spy transmitter. If you have two people with suitcases, you get a much more accurate fix. Um, but that was one technique. And then the Germans developed this uh, direction finding system and it's hidden. So this guy looks just like um, a, a, 
uh, a typical uh, officer uh, walking around, or maybe even a civilian just walking around in his in his raincoat. And then, if you um, open up his coat, you see that he has a radio. So if he does a flashing act, you can see that the radio receiver is strapped around his waist. That's pretty well concealed. You see a little bulge there, but not horrendous. And the antenna for the receiver goes down the two arms, his two arms there. And when he's walking along, uh, his arms essentially are the direction finding antenna. And this little device, which looks like a wristwatch on his wrist, is the signal strength meter. He doesn't want to have earphones because that would be pretty obvious. So he uses a signal strength meter to uh, determine when he, his body is pointing toward or away from the uh, radio station. By walking around, he can get several bearings and locate the station. So body-worn direction-finding sets were used by the Germans, the Allies, uh, and the Russians uh, to help locate spy radio transmitters. Um, when a spy radio transmitter was located, uh, if they got there in time before the spy transmitting uh, agent left, uh, he would be shot. And so it was important not to let them locate these people. And one of the techniques was to send transmissions in very, very short bursts, not to send a five minute or even a one minute a Morse code message, but to send a one or two or three or four or five second uh, Morse code message. And uh, nobody can send Morse code that fast, uh, so it had to be done automatically. And here was one of the early attempts to develop a technique for sending Morse code extremely rapidly. If you take the stylus that you see down below and you run it down each of these vertical columns, um, it, it makes contact and essentially sends a Morse coded letter. So you can run down, let's say you take over on the left, you can see dot dash, the lighter part being two copper points in there. Uh, when you run the stylus down there, you're going to get dot dash or a, the next one to the right, dash, dot, 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 or B, and then dash, dot, dash, dot, or C. And you can do this very rapidly with this stylus so that your transmitter is not on the air for very long. And that means that a direction-finding uh, truck with a rotatable antenna uh, doesn't have time to really zero in on your message. So that was one of the techniques, and that technique was improved uh, by using uh, various kinds of automated signal transmitting where you could uh, transmit messages at uh, 75 or 150 words per minute uh, with uh, a moving tape or film. Um, the other technique that was used with uh, spy radio was, of course, to encipher the messages. And there were lots of techniques for enciphering messages. Um, the uh, uh, hand techniques involving a code book uh, were quite widely used um, in which, for instance, you see here a message that was hand enciphered and transmitted by Morse code to the British. Um, and it was enciphered using a, uh, a book uh, to identify what each of those letters is. And uh, some of the messages were had to be hidden inside objects like uh, this walnut shell in a, an enciphered message. And uh, here's a German spy who was caught in Britain. Uh, and uh, when a spy is caught in, in England or in America, um, they're typically given two choices. One, you can cooperate with the British or the Americans and keep on sending transmissions and we'll tell you what to send and we'll be sending false transmissions back to Germany and it'll seem just like you're sending them. Or the other option, 
we'll kill you. <laughs> so uh, uh, Tate was one of the people who decided, okay, I'll send the messages for you. Don't kill me. But interestingly, if quite a few of the German agents who were caught opted to be killed rather than send false messages back. Um, Tate used a code wheel because Enigma machines are really too heavy and too big for a, a secret agent to carry into a country. And uh, the code wheel work uh, quite effectively in very much the same way that the Civil War code wheel uh, work that we saw earlier. Um, German spy controllers did use Enigma machines to keep their messages secret and send uh, messages to each other, but they did not use enigmas to contact the spies directly. So the enigmas were used uh, to send messages from one spy controller to another. And they were so totally and completely convinced that the enigma was completely secure that they used the enigma uh, to tell each other what the location of their spy was. Uh, we have a guy on uh, 32nd Street and 5th Avenue in New York City, for instance. They just gave that away. And of course, in England or in America, um, being able to decode the Enigma messages um, allowed the Americans and the British to go directly to the spy's location and arrest them and give them the choice, <laughs> either you die or you send messages for us. And uh, uh, so this uh, technique uh, worked so well that it is believed that every single German spy that came into England and communicated with uh, the uh, allies, um, with the allies uh, was caught. Uh, every every spy in England was supposedly caught. I don't know if it's true or not, but it certainly makes sense since the Germans were giving away their addresses, names and addresses um, in Enigma code. And um, the Enigma had been cracked. Um, three Polish mathematicians initially um, discovered how to crack the Enigma code. And when Poland was overrun, they gave that information to the British. And then the British started breaking the Enigma codes. Um, the Enigma codes were used by all branches of the German military. And uh, this is a picture of the British agents uh, listening in on Enigma messages. And the Enigma machine itself is really uh, very straightforward. You type a letter in on the keys that you see in the front of the machine, and uh, the electric voltage from that key goes through a wiring complex and into the uh, light bulb panel, and it lights up a letter on the light bulb panel that you see behind the keyboard. So all that an Enigma machine does is say, you type in a letter like T and it changes it to a different letter like V and lights up the letter V on the panel. Um, if you were to encipher the word Enigma, E-N-I-G-M-A on a Enigma machine, it might end up uh, being X-P-T-Q-F-K. Uh, a complex combination of letters that would be exceptionally difficult to decipher unless you had another Enigma machine. And if you have a second Enigma machine that is set the same way as the first Enigma machine was set, then typing in the ciphertext uh, word XPTQFK would reconstitute back into the word Enigma. So a very neat machine. And I've been collecting and restoring and fixing <laughs> Enigma machines for 40 years now, and I'm pretty darn familiar with them. Uh, they are basically not much more complicated than a flashlight. They have a battery, a switch, which is the key switch, and a light bulb. <laughs> so it's sort of like playing with flashlights. Um, in New York City, uh, spies were operating, and this guy... Uh, made it look like he had a ham station. Of course, hams were forbidden to transmit during World War II, but uh, this guy 
uh, was transmitting, and uh, he was caught by a direction-finding team in New York City. And you can see him there with his uh, helicrafter's equipment, uh, and helicrafter speaker on the right, uh, ready to uh, transmit messages to Germany. And uh, he didn't use ham call letters, but he just sent very short messages. And the New York City FBI office was able to catch him. He was actually located on the top floor of this apartment building. So he had a very easy time putting up antennas. He just ran the antenna up inside the chimney so it wouldn't be visible. And that was the classic a uh, way that most of the spy radio operators who operated indoors set up their antennas. They would simply run the antenna up inside the chimney where it couldn't be seen from outside. And uh, so at the end of the war, uh, the uh, people were given back their radios. They'd all had their radios confiscated from them. And uh, uh, the war ended and went transitioned into the, the Cold War. So that's a um, sort of a short summary of spy radio. And I just want to go on and talk about the Cold War and the CIA bugs. I think that you'll find it uh, quite interesting. Um, this uh, research was done by two uh, people in the Netherlands, two hams, Paul Rubers and Mark Simons, and they have a museum, uh, a virtual museum, cryptomuseum.com. And uh, I'll just give some of the information that they worked out. Uh, spies typically need to listen in on conversations. And one of the classic techniques was to use a hidden microphone uh, disguised as something. And this is a typical picture of a microphone disguised as a wristwatch. And with a long sleeve shirt, the wire could go right up inside the shirt and you couldn't tell that this was a microphone. It'd be quite hard to tell. Um, Lots and lots of pieces of clothing were used to hide uh, microphones. There's a mid hidden microphone uh, and radio transmitter that was hidden inside a neckband, a uh, necktie. Um, this is a, a CAT scan of the inside of a CIA bug in a pen. Uh, this is a fountain pen that has a radio transmitter inside it. And you can see from left to right the battery, a uh, little microphone that picked up sound in the room, and then a couple of transistors, at the transmitter, and the antenna was that little short piece of wire off to the right. So all fit inside a fountain pen body. Very neat and uh, quite a challenge in those days with discrete components. Nowadays, you could have surface mount stuff and have it one-tenth the size. But uh, uh, in those days, this is pretty small for uh, discrete component transistors. Um, another device that turned up is a, a phone tap. And this is a, a German phone tap uh, that was used in East Germany by the Russians who wanted to tap into people's phones. They would go into the basement of a person's house dressed in telephone uh, repairman outfits. And if anyone asked, they would say, oh, we're putting this signal conditioning circuit in your line because the, the telephone line's very noisy. But actually, um, although it says it's a signal conditioning uh, sensor. It is actually a phone tap. And basically, a phone tap is just a, a bunch of condensers that uh, uh, isolate the uh, circuit, the outgoing audio from the telephone line. So you can't tell that the phone line is being tapped because there are capacitors, no, no change in the DC uh, resistance of the line. Um, here's another KGB bug. A uh, very, very simple circuit in which the uh, microphone actually directly connects to the tank circuit of the transmitter. And you can see over on the, the left, uh, in the middle drawing here on the left is the microphone. And you can see it's directly connected to the tank circuit of the transmitter. And the transmitter has the little discrete component transistor uh, as the oscillator. So very, very simple circuit. 
problem with all of these devices is that they do need a battery. And uh, that means that they you can't just leave them indefinitely. You have to go in and change them or change the battery. And they're just gazillions of these things that have been made over the years uh, and hiding uh, inside all sorts of things like telephones and, and pens and so on. Uh, one of the really strange um, ideas that the CIA came up with was to actually build a bug <laughs> that was actually a, an imitation insect. So in the 1970s, they built a drone, uh, an electrically controlled drone that had a microphone in its tail, and it was disguised to look like a bug flying around in the room. It wasn't very successful because it's hard to control this thing and it, it's hard to ignore a, a thing that's about an inch long buzzing around inside a room. And it had to make some noise. So it wasn't a, an overly successful experiment, but uh, it's pretty funny to think that the CIA was experimenting with bugs like this. And then they got the brilliant idea of using a real bug <laughs> and they uh, they got this bug and they mounted a radio transmitter on the bug and it was a, it's a live dragonfly and they uh, glued this radio transmitter onto the back of the dragonfly and had this thing flying around inside the room uh, it's a, a pretty neat idea but you couldn't really tell where the dragonfly was going to fly so uh, it was really i think a, a failed experiment but uh, Kind of fun to think of a bug bug like this. Um, in uh, the um, time right at the end of the war, um, the um, US decided to build an embassy in Moscow. And uh, they uh, <coughs> built the embassy and the Russians gave them a carved United States seal as a uh, um, uh, sort of a, a symbol of friendship between Russia and America. So the United States had this embassy and the Russians gave them this great seal of the United States to put up inside the embassy. And uh, they put it up, the Americans put it up, and it wasn't until 1952 seven years after they had been given this thing, that they found that this great seal had a bug inside it. It was just sitting on the wall with a microphone inside it, and they didn't see that, and they didn't realize it. Uh, perhaps because uh, up until this point, all microphones and all bugs typically had to be powered by a battery, or at least uh, a, a wire and this seal had no obvious battery or wire, and it just sat on the wall for seven years. So uh, a battery wouldn't have lasted that long. And uh, so it was found in 1952, and nobody knew what it was. How could this thing be listening in inside the embassy uh, without a battery, without a radio transmitter? Uh, and it wasn't until 1960 that the uh, uh, United States uh, revealed that the, the embassy had been uh, bugged. And the question is, how could this have been done with no electronic parts and no batteries? How could it be listening? Um, and here's a, a picture of the, uh, one of the people in the United States uh, saying, the Russians did this to us. They they bugged our embassy and showing the the bug inside the uh, device. Now, how did this work? Let's figure it out. Um, the thing, as it was called before they really understood what it was, uh, consisted of a metal rod that you see in the upper part here that came into a cylinder and the cylinder had inside it uh, a metal uh, plate and on one end a microphone diaphragm, diaphragm and the way this thing worked was that audio came in uh, through this uh, round um, sort of uh, opening and it caused the uh, metal membrane 
the third thing in there to vibrate back and forth. And when that vibrated back and forth, it acted like a condenser with respect to the round plate that was already inside this round can. So vibrations of the metal plate changed its capacitive loading or capacitive uh, coupling to the condenser. And what that meant was that every audio sound in the room was picked up and was changed into a varying capacitance. How could that become a radio transmitter then? It was the question. And the answer was that this device was constantly being irradiated by a high energy radio transmitter. And the transmitter was being received by this rod that you see over here. And the transmitter was making that rod essentially resonate at the frequency of the transmitter, the radio frequency. And then the frequency of resonance of the rod was being modified by the changing capacitance to this metal plate. So as audio came into this device, the um, frequency of the rod shifted slightly, and that could be received by a receiver that was tuned to this frequency and looking for a phase shift between the incident radio voltage and or RF voltage and the uh, voltage that this antenna was essentially radiating. You can sort of see the diagram down in the bottom left. You see a transmitter uh, radiating energy to this passive element, the antenna, and the antenna being modulated by a microphone, uh, which changes the capacitance to the antenna and therefore the resonant frequency of the antenna. And this is then picked up by the receiver in the lower left. An amazing and clever technique that allowed this device to listen into the Russian to the American embassy uh, from 1945 to 1953, seven years. Now the Americans decided they were going to get even with the Russians by trying to put one of these same devices inside the Russian embassy in The Hague in 1958. They started doing this. The Russian embassy is on the left and uh, the American embassy is on the right. And they were, the idea was if they could get one of these devices into the Russian embassy and radiate it with power signal RF from the building on the right, then they'd be able to detect the audio in the room in the Russian embassy. They did this by uh, building uh, one of these devices into a piece of furniture. And you can see the antenna on the upper right there was dropped into a hole in a hollowed out leg of a desk uh, that was installed in the Russian embassy uh, in 1958. And uh, that allowed them to be able to detect audio. So here's a, um, a sky view or satellite view of the uh, Russian embassy on the right and the, um, uh, the sending station on the left. Uh, and they were able to actually transmit over a period of, uh, distance of 125 meters uh, to the Russian embassy and receive the signal back over 125 meters. Pretty hefty. I guess that's the equivalent of uh, four, roughly four football fields, a, a fairly hefty distance. And uh, here's a picture of the um, the, um, the uh, uh, American embassy in which the transmitter is located up a flight of stairs. And they were shooting through a window with a directional antenna. And the antenna uh, allowed them to increase the uh, 500 watt transmitted signal that they sent out uh, by 14 decibels. And that allowed them to have an effective radiated power, ERP, of 10 kilowatts. So they were radiating the Russian embassy with 10 kilowatts of RF energy to uh, resonate, cause the uh, re resonating of that antenna in the leg of the table, which allowed them to pick up uh, the audio from that room. 
And uh, if you remember, in uh, 2016, it was discovered that a number of U.S. diplomats and CIA officials that had been posted in Cuba and China were beginning to complain of all sorts of problems, debilitating headaches, vertigo, nausea, memory loss, dizziness, tinnitus, and other symptoms. And it is now believed in the 2020 issue of the journal Science Magazine, uh, they reported that the National Academy of Sciences has concluded that the pulsed high energy radio waves probably caused the syndrome. This is known as the Havana syndrome. And it is most likely, I think, that the Russians were getting back at us uh, by bombarding the uh, diplomats wherever their quarters were with very, very high RF energy. And that was producing physiological effects on the people in those embassies. So with that, we'll call it quits and uh, open it up to questions. And I hope you've enjoyed our little quick run through. I'll stop sharing here and uh, we'll see if we can get back to normal. So that's that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Helps if I unmute. Okay, let me, we got a hand raised by Gene. Go ahead, Gene. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Uh, this was a fascinating trip down memory lane. While I was uh, first joined the army, I was served in, uh, served in Germany. This was still during the Cold War. And as the wall was falling down, after there's a storm, we came back and had an opportunity to go to the border of Berlin, East and West Berlin. And on the uh, Western side, there was a museum called Checkpoint Charlie's. And it showed a number of the uh, pieces of equipment that you just uh, showed and talked about along with some other stuff too about how what people use to uh, escape East Germany from, but uh, amazing uh, presentation. And about during the entire time, I was thinking of myself back in Germany at that time. And that was in 1991, just as the wall was coming down. But they still had rules and regulations as far as East and West goes. Great job, thank you. Yeah, they've turned a lot of those uh, uh, former KGB headquarters into museums. And uh, several of them are called terror museums because they always had a killing room in the headquarters where they had a drain in the floor for the blood and they would just kill the people that they uh, wanted to kill. And uh, there's a lot of radio equipment. Uh, that the Russians left behind uh, and an incredible number of tape recorders. Apparently, every everybody they brought in as a suspected whatever um, was exhaustively interviewed and taped before they were killed. And so there's just miles and miles of recordings of the interviews with these people. Um, so it's been turned into a museum. One of the most interesting museums that I went to over there was a Russian missile silo. Uh, and they, uh, they, Russians had left, they took the missiles, but they left everything else. And it has been turned into a museum. You can go into this thing, a missile was about 100 feet high. And you could stand around the top of where the missile was, look down into this silo. And all the electronics equipment, most of it was still there. And they made it into a very effective museum. The part that really got me was that there were four missiles in this complex, and each of those missiles was um, uh, had an atomic warhead and was targeted on a different major European city. They didn't have the ability to make it across to the United States, but they had uh, Paris and uh, London, various uh, cities targeted. Each missile had its own city. And I guess from the looks of the darn thing, it would have wiped out the whole city if they had let it fly. So yeah, there's a lot to see over there. Right. Here, in the, here in the United States, we uh, basically sold them and people turned them into underground condominiums. Yeah. Okay, anybody else? Looking for hands? Looks like we got a, something going on there with Paul. 
Paul, are you you're clapping? You're not there's your hand. <laughs> He's clapping. Um, back in uh, many years ago, I used to work for a very large uh, corporation that is now all but blunt, and that was Eastman Kodak Company. And in Rochester, New York, I don't know if it's still there or not, but they have a museum. And in that museum is all the different spike hammers and how they use them that they uh, uh, that they made. You know, and want stuff for ties, stuff for all kinds of stuff. Anyway, uh, it's interesting stuff. Looking for more hands. Yeah, Nothing. if you ever ever taken a trip to Europe, almost any of the countries that were occupied uh, have uh, resistance museums now, and you can just see wall to wall incredible, wonderful little tiny things that the uh, resistance built, radios and so on, and and cameras were were uh, widely used. <laughs> it's it's just amazing. Um, you know, and you think that was all going on back then. Today, it's still going on in some fashion or another. And with technology being what it is, God only knows what that stuff looks like. Maybe it's a, 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 a button on a shirt or something. Who knows? Okay. Well, uh, we just hit right at the hour. Good timing. I don't see any more questions. Hands up. There's really nothing in chat. There's some statements, but no uh, no actual uh comments so at any rate with that in mind we'll shut her down for the night and get ready for tomorrow night thank you everybody for showing up and being here tom thank you very much once again you give great presentations really appreciate you sir and thank you for running this all of this dan you're just amazing <laughs> trust me i have a whole crew behind me i i sit in front of the camera but the people behind me do all the work well okay. thanks to all of them <laughs> 73 is everyone. I'll see you tomorrow, hopefully. And uh, uh, and again, Tom, hopefully we can have you on again. You get good presentations. <laughs> yeah. All right, 73s. Bye-bye.